Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Lanchowski. I am uh, president of the Institute. I'd like to welcome you all here. For those of you who are new to IWP, we are an independent graduate school of international affairs and national security. We offer uh, five master's degree programs, uh, a doctoral program, which is fairly new. Uh, we also offer individual courses that you can come and take without uh, or audit uh, at lesser cost uh, if you don't need a degree and you can do this without committing to uh, an entire semester's or a year's worth of tuition. Uh, we specialize in teaching all of the different arts of statecraft, the different instruments of national power, and how they are integrated in national strategy. There is no other school that has a curriculum architecture like this. Uh, we are delighted today to receive a, a distinguished diplomat here uh, from Hungary, uh, Ambassador Laszlo Szabo. Uh, he is a physician, a surgeon by uh, profession. He has been in business, uh, he has been in politics, and he has been uh, Hungary's ambassador to the United States since uh, 2017. Um, he has uh, in his medical uh, background, he practiced as a transplant surgeon. Uh, spent 20 years in the pharmaceutical field uh, and uh, was the uh, and has, has uh, had a number of different leadership positions in his country uh, as a country manager for New Zealand and the South Pacific and uh, and was eventually he was vice president of China uh, human resources at Eli Lilly company uh, he became the CEO of Hungarian operations of Teva, and in 2014, when the government of Hungary decided to put trade and investment to the forefront and looked for a seasoned business leader, Ambassador Sabo was approached to join public service. He served as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, building up the trade uh, division of the ministry until his appointment as ambassador here. Uh, he has been a visitor here to the Institute in, in the past and we're we are delighted and honored that he will join us to talk about one of the uh, pivotal countries in Eastern, Eastern and Central Europe, its role uh, in, in the region and in the world. Ambassador Sabo, welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Professor, to, for this uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, you make me feel old, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I really appreciate uh, uh, IWP to, to host me today. Uh, what we planned is, uh, is a relatively short, like 20 minutes, 30 minutes uh, short discussion. Uh, I brought you a few uh, kind of interesting uh, descriptions of the dyna dynamics of the European Union and Hungary's role in the European Union and, uh, and maybe we can have some uh, Q&A uh, after that. Uh, in our view, the, the <coughs> original idea of the founding fathers of the European Union was uh, somewhat different uh, from what is, it, what is perceived today about the European Union. We believe the original idea was to create a strong uh, uh, cohesion between independent countries uh, based on the European civilization, of course, and I will come back to that later, uh, with values of democracy uh, and uh, the free will of people and the joint free market. This was the original idea in, in my translation. Uh, what it became is a political powerhouse, basically, uh, mostly a left liberal uh, political powerhouse. So it's not necessarily what we would like to see in Brussels. 
However, there's a lot of controversies uh, around uh, uh, the European Union leadership and some member states in the European Union who are perceived very differently depending on who uh, wants to talk about those, those countries. Two countries have been singled out uh, of the 28 member states uh, purely on political basis. Uh, one of them is Poland, the other one is Hungary. Uh, it's not a coincidence, of course, if you look at the current leadership of the European Union and the leadership of Poland and Hungary, you see why this is happening. Also, our stance on quite a few issues uh, that are engaging uh, Europe these days, uh, we have opposite uh, opinions and uh, we offer opposite solutions as well. Uh, and uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, the European Union leadership and uh, and uh, the left liberal media of Europe, and the US for that matter, is uh, really attacking some of the member states that uh, don't necessarily agree with the leadership of the European Union. One of the major drives of the former socialist countries, Central Eastern Europe, uh, was to join the European Union, was uh, this eagerness to rejoin Europe. Uh, in Hungary's 1100 years of history, uh, we were always part of Europe, we always considered ourselves Europeans, uh, but during the, the communist or socialist times, uh, the 45 years of Soviet occupation, it didn't feel like we are part uh, of Europe. So for us, it was a big deal, and it's still a big deal, uh, to rejoin uh, Europe, although it's a little bit frustrating that uh, 15 years after Hungary, Poland, uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic joining the European Union, we are still considered newcomers. I, I think this tells a lot for you. Um, one thing is for sure, uh, the European Union was created to have mutually beneficial economic benefits for the members. And we have enjoyed those benefits just like everyone else in the European Union. There is this also fake uh, fake perception that the newcomers, of course there were several waves uh, after the old traditional Europe uh, was member of this unity, uh, the, the perception is that, uh, that there are the donor countries and the recipient countries and the rich countries are helping the poor countries to grow up. Thing is, uh, the, the, the newcomers, and I use quote unquote here, the newcomers actually provided a lot of benefits for the old traditional Europe. Quite clearly, they opened up their markets, they created a free economy, so all the strong guys, the strong big corporations of, of Europe, Western Europe obviously, were able to establish huge marks on the economic uh, profile of these countries. Practically, they, I wouldn't say they got a free lunch, but uh, their market, the markets were opened for them, and obviously they were much smarter, much bigger, much weaker, much richer than anyone locally uh, when those countries opened up their economies. Uh, it's very hard to be exact in these numbers, but every single euro that came to the east from the west in the European Union in forms of cohesion funds uh, provided at least two euros back to major corporations uh, in Europe. So it's a pretty good business if you think about it. If you had to put your own money in this, it's a very nice return on investment. And those, those returns were pretty quick, uh, because obviously we had uh, more, uh, or more desire to have a, a better infrastructure, more desire to have a free market, more desire to have a selection of goods in the shops, what we always admire during the socialist times in the West. Uh, this uh, equilibrium uh, has improved, obviously, but has not uh, brought up these newcomers, again, quote-unquote, uh, to the level of the, of the West. Obviously, we have a lot of things to be proud of, but uh, quite clearly, the development of these countries was not that famous exercise in the last 20 years. When it comes to being pro-European or anti-European, this is also a very nice uh, theme to discuss. First of all, those countries who criticize uh, Poland and Hungary uh, to be anti-European, they really don't read the numbers. If you ask the, the, the general public around the support for the, for the principles 
of the European Union, Poland and Hungary has approximately 80, 80 percent support for the European Union. You ask common people on the streets. If you ask the same question in Western Europe, the numbers are more like 30 to 50 percent. So there's quite a huge discrepancy uh, with, with those numbers. So when it comes to pro-European or anti-European, it's more like pro-European leadership or anti-European leadership, or pro-European policies and anti-European policies. This is a big distinction. So uh, many people have asked me about, uh, after the, after the uh, announcement of Brexit, whether there will be a, a Hunxit or something like I don't know how to pronounce this. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't intend to leave the European Union. We enjoy the benefits of the European Union. We believe the European Union, as a basic principle and as the rules and regulations of the European Union are working, is actually good. It's working uh, and it's one of the strongest economies in the world if we combine forces together. Also, uh, you, you could see in the last uh, couple of months, uh, maybe a few years, that, uh, that the European Union is, is labeling countries with uh, interesting uh, titles like, uh, like country without rule of law, uh, a country with autocracy, and all sorts of, of uh, interesting uh, definitions. These are really not accurate or punctual description of, of any country because rule of law doesn't really have a definition. If you consider rule of law as, as kind of a general description of how well a country is adopted to its own legal environment or the international legal environment, then uh, the European Union has a self-controlling mechanism. It's called the infringement procedure. So if one of the countries don't behave or they breach some of the guidelines or the rules, the regulations, the legislation of the European Union, an infringement procedure is initiated against that country the country has to investigate, audit, negotiate, and they agree with the European Union whether it's okay to continue this way or it's not okay, so they have to adjust the course. And this can be anything from legislation on, on uh, free access to goods, uh, taxes, uh, any, any walks of life, parts of life that is regulated by the European Union. Let me just tell you the 2018 uh, picture about infringement procedures. Hungary, just like Poland, is in the top 10 best compliant countries of the European Union. Unlike, and I just name a few, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Greece. They have three or four times more infringement procedures against them than Hungary. Okay? Have you ever heard the question whether there's rule of law in, in, in the UK or in Spain or in Germany. <coughs> so again, singling out the newcomers, quote unquote. Uh, an even harsher number, what I would like to just mention, these are reports from the European Union, so, so I'm not using any intermediary source. There is a so-called Article 260, I'm reading the definition for you. An Article 260 case is opened when a member state fails to comply with the judgment of the court that found a failure to fulfill an obligation under the EU law by that member state. So it means that when an infringement procedure uh, decides against the country, the country has to fulfill the obligation of the European Union. Do you know how many of 260 uh, article cases uh, were against Hungary in 2018? Zero. And let me not again list the number of countries who are not zeros, like Greece or Spain. We are talking about dozens of, of those. So rule of law. Who, who is the judge here? Who is the judge whether these countries have rule of law or not? Um, <coughs> I believe uh, uh, a real division started between leaderships of member states and the European Union uh, when in 2015 we had probably by many one of the largest uh, challenges of Europe since the Second World War. And this is the migration crisis. 
migration crisis, and I'm not uh, talking about refugee crisis, I'm talking about migration crisis with an intention. I would like to define what is illegal migration, what is migration, what is refugee crisis. The Geneva Convention clearly states that if you need to run for your life because of your religion, your sex, your social status, your beliefs, you are considered a refugee until you reach the first safe place where you are provided for your basic human needs. If you leave that safe place and you start walking through or flying through or, or bust through seven, eight safe countries, you are not a refugee anymore, you are a migrant looking for a better uh, opportunity to live. This is obviously it's a valid requirement by anyone, but this is not a human right. A human right is to provide for a refugee and uh, in our view, it's every country's own decision uh, who they let in for economic reasons, okay? So these definitions are very important because these were completely disregarded by many politicians of the European Union in the last three, four years, and uh, by most of the media in the, next, the last three, four years. It's also quite funny that uh, Germany is not, uh, not criticized for the lack of freedom of press, but in Germany, the press was told not to use the word migrants. They had to use refugee in 2015, 2016, 2017. And we heard German journalists talking about it, that their editors, their editorial were told which words to use, which words not to use. And we are talking about Germany, okay? Not Poland, not Hungary. Um, in 2015, uh, since then, actually, as a deputy foreign minister, I've been using uh, an anecdote. I know, I, I know it's not a, not, not a nice thing to use an anecdote in such a tragic situation what the illegal migration crisis was in Hungary. But uh, uh, when the European Union came up with the idea that mandatory quotas should be applied all across Europe, so the so-called refugees who flooded Europe, and we are talking about more than 2 million people here, in the last few years, uh, they should be distributed between countries. And we just simply didn't like it because, first of all, we thought that we should stop the influx of illegal migration, so we should really take care of the root causes of illegal migration. When, uh, in the first half of 2015, Hungary was suffering from illegal migrants uh, tramping through our borders, a day 8,000 to 10,000 people came through the, the green borders. They completely disregarded any regulations. They didn't want to even get close to the official border crossing the areas. They didn't want to identify themselves. They didn't want to comply with anything. They didn't want to go to the hot zones, what we created for them, to give them proper health care, proper food, accommodation, medical care, schooling for the kids. They were not interested. They wanted to go to Germany, Sweden. Why? because the subsidies are the highest in Europe, in those countries. It's, it's, it's for the money. That's why we call them economic migrants. As soon as we created uh, a physical barrier, a fence, uh, on our southern border, uh, uh, and by the way, we were obliged to do that by the European Union, because that's the, that's the law, the Schengen Treaty mandates us to protect the border from illegal entry, the external border of the European Union. When we did that, suddenly we became the black sheep of the flock. We were the only country keeping the rules of the European Union, and we were singled out. How, the, the, how we dare doing this? Interestingly enough, when two years earlier, in 2013, Sweden built a fence between Bulgaria and Turkey, funded by the European Union, <coughs> that was absolutely kosher. If it's Swedish still, Ericsson technology, everyone's happy. When it's Hungarian iron and Hungarian fence, that's not good. That's not good. So it's it's quite interesting to be singled out uh, in a way that in some countries it's praiseable what they do, in other countries that's a fascist act. It's terrible. Anyway, when we when we built that fence in the middle of 2015, we were even criticized by our next door neighbor, uh, the Chancellor of Austria, two chancellors ago. Uh, he told us that uh, Hungary behaves, or Hungary reminds him of the darkest days of the Second World War. Wow. That's what he said. Three months later, they started building the same fence. Uh, but instead of a fence, they built gates with long wings. 
those wings were 40 kilometers long with barbed wire on the top, but these were gates, not fences. This is the hypocrisy. European voters are fed up. And this is clearly what uh, we just simply don't like. Hungarians have been freedom fighters for the last 1,100 years, and I believe we will continue to be freedom fighters, just like many European countries, of course. Our borders have been redrawn many times. We survived. We have a very strange language, a very unique culture, and uh, it's really a miracle that this country was able to, to push this through 1,100 years. Uh, I wouldn't say we are dead because we suffered a lot, but, uh, but the culture of Hungary is, uh, is very strong and it's alive and it's thriving. Um, when I talked about the gate with long wings, also I would like to talk about a myth uh, that is going on there. Uh, when we built the fence on the Croatian-Hungarian and Serbian-Hungarian borders, we actually never closed down the borders. We closed down the green uh, field access to the country, but the official border crossing areas were always free to commute. So anyone who came with good intentions, with a passport, with a, with a visa, a Schengen visa, or if they didn't have any documents uh, and they presented themselves as, uh, as someone who's asking for asylum, we included them in the, uh, in the process that is described by the European Union. And if they waited uh, for the time until this decision was made, we let them in. So that, that, that was the name of the game. So we actually never closed down the borders. But there's a slight difference between knocking on the door and asking for permission to enter versus tramping through the door or the window or the wall and just ruin everything in your way. Big difference between the two things. We believe that uh, mass migration is not helping the European civilization. Uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, the Western civilization is, is uh, based on, on uh, Christianity. We don't believe that everyone should be a Christian. We don't believe that everyone has to be a believer. And we are big fighters of religious freedom. Uh, but we don't think that, uh, that any invasive culture should be taking over and start, should start dominating uh, Western civilization. It's in our constitution that we are a Christian country, and we would like to stay this way. Again, everyone is welcome in the country. We have 32 recognized religions that are either supported by 1% of taxpayers' money uh, in the country. So, so uh, when it comes to religious freedom, we are all for it. But this doesn't mean that we want to give up uh, our identity and our civilization and our culture. Let me just give you another few uh, symptoms of the European Union. For us, it's quite telling that uh, these interesting procedures and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, letters and projects the European Union is initiating against those who don't necessarily agree with everything uh, what the current leadership of Brussels is doing. In the meantime, there are quite obvious uh, uh, events that can give you an idea of what's really going on in Europe. When, I believe it was last summer, when President Juncker uh, 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 visited a small town in Germany and uh, he unveiled the statue of Karl Marx. This was absolutely natural. Nobody criticized it in the, in the left liberal press. I don't know if you have heard about this. It really didn't go through the world press in this time. But can you believe that the, the founding father of communism is praised by the president of the European Union? A hundred million people died in the 20th century because of communism. And the, the president of the European Union is celebrating the founder, the, the idea maker of communism. So that's what's going on in Europe. So we believe uh, the fact that in May there will be a European parliamentary election we believe it will make a big difference in the, in the lives of, of Europeans, and we certainly hope that the trend that has started since 2015 uh, in national elections, national parliamentary elections uh, across the European Union will, will continue. At least this is our uh, plan. Just to give you a few highlights, uh, in 2017 there were elections in the Netherlands where actually the far-right party the second biggest party in the country. Bulgaria, center-right uh, 
uh, in France, uh, Emmanuel Macron actually left kind of the big flock, the, the big traditional parties, and he created an alternative. At least this is how it looked during the campaign. He created an alternative to the big parties. Now we know that he's a left, uh, leftist uh, politician, but, uh, but obviously the, the voters, the electors of, of France were clearly voting against the establishment uh, when it was the French election. In Germany, although Chancellor Merkel uh, was able to, to uh, put her party into the winning uh, seat, uh, they had not had such a low support for long, long decades. And her victory was clearly overshadowed by the surge of the, of the alternative for Germany party. Austria, the People's Party won. Uh, a very young, uh, great Chancellor Sebastian Kurz uh, took position. Interestingly enough, his views on illegal migration are practically identical with the Hungarian views and the Visegrad 4 uh, countries' view. Czech Republic, also an anti establishment uh, uh, policy uh, uh, revealed, and uh, there's a, a clear shift towards the right. In 2018, we had Italy, very clear center right uh, new leadership, and even Sweden, who is probably one of the most socialist uh, countries of Europe. Uh, there's obviously something troublesome there because they spent months uh, to create a coalition and even today they are, they are fighting to have a proper budget for 2018. In the meantime, the Visegrad four countries are doing pretty well, I have to say. Um, the Hungarian uh, ruling party, uh, Fidesz and KDP, which is a Christian Democratic Party, it's a coalition between these two parties, had won for the third consecutive uh, uh, time with absolute majority in 2010, 2014, and 2018, all the three times absolute majority, and uh, with one of the highest participation rates in any elections before, uh, approximately 70% of people went to the polls uh, to elect. At that time, before the elections, everyone said, it will, if it will be a high participation rate, uh, Fidesz will lose. Actually, it was the opposite uh, turnout. Quite clearly, um, in those countries, in those parties where the response to the biggest challenges and the biggest, biggest headaches of European citizens uh, were responded, those parties gained in these elections in the European uh, Union in the last two years. And in those countries where practically they were inadequate answers or they didn't even recognize the problem, uh, they basically uh, failed or lost popularity. Uh, I actually wanted to give you this anecdote about 10 minutes ago, but I lost my track, so let me give you this anecdote. This was about the mandatory quotas. Uh, two gentlemen are standing in a room, and one of them is pointing upwards and says, hey, there's water <coughs> from the ceiling, so we should do something about uh, this water. Let's find the pipe, and, and let's close the, uh, the pipe. And the other one says, no, 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 no. We have to first agree how we will distribute the water in the rooms. So, I hope you see what I, what I mean. This is what the mandatory quota is. It's not about the solution, it's about how to deal with the symptom. This will not be the solution, uh, not to the European Union, and uh, I believe not to any other country that uh, lets illegal migration to flourish. There were relatively recent uh, data about uh, the European people. So these are European white polls. 66%, so exactly two-thirds of Europeans, disapprove how the EU handled the refugee crisis in the last few years, 66%. Interestingly enough, this percentage is higher in Germany than in Hungary. Okay? This is just a hint of how politicians and the people meet. Uh, and 74% of the people of Europe uh, want decision made by their own governments on migration and not by EU. So again, the EU is, is, is not a political body. The EU is an economic interest alliance, and we believe this is how it should be. Hungary strongly believes that, uh, that uh, a strong European Union can be made of strong member states, rather than strong Brussels. And when I mean Brussels, that's uh, the European Parliament, obviously, and the European Commission. Okay, uh, a few 
few facts uh, about Hungary, just to give you an idea of the last uh, few years. In 2010, when this government uh, took over from the socialist government, uh, the country was almost in a bankrupt state, incredibly high deficit, uh, huge debt, uh, border 12% unemployment rate, so it was really a terrible situation. Uh, Greek, Greece and Hungary were probably the two countries on the bottom of, of the list. Uh, we went two completely different directions. Greece have asked for more money from IMF. Hungary actually repaid all the debt to IMF from an almost empty budget. You can see the results now. Uh, I, I'm not commenting on, on Greece. You, you probably know uh, your numbers or your evaluation. Hungary, in the meantime, has uh, worked down its national debt from 85% to 71%. Hungary has reduced unemployment rate from 12% to 3.6%. We grew the number of people who work in the country. We have a, an approximately 10 million people in the country. Uh, in 2010, 2.7 million people worked in the country. Now it's 4.6 million people who work in the country, almost double of what we used to have. Also, when it comes to growth, uh, in 2010, we had a 7.8% decrease of our GDP. Decrease. 7.8% decrease. Now it's 5.2% increase. Second highest in Europe. So we are, we are having different problems than what we have. 2010. In 2010, we were struggling to find uh, jobs for the people. Now we are struggling to find the people for the jobs that are being created by the economy. This is a much better problem, I have to say. And, and we are glad that we, based on the German model, actually, we introduced the dual vocational uh, schooling system. Uh, we really encourage academia to talk to industry and understand what industry needs. And uh, we encourage the dialogue between big industrial players and schools in Hungary so they can adopt their curriculum uh, to the best possible way so that uh, companies can meet their future needs. Also, we created a very flexible labor code in the country, so it's much easier for companies to adjust the size of the workforce to their actual needs. And instead of hurting uh, employees, actually this created a much more buzzing uh, uh, environment. Uh, it's much easier to find jobs for people. And we mobilized a quite huge uh, section of society that used to lean on subsidies. Uh, Hungary was also criticized to create this public work system that was created for people who have been unemployed for, an, um, uh, for a, a lengthened uh, period of time. In Hungary, if you are on an unemployment <coughs> for three months, after that, uh, you will be given a public job if you haven't found a job with a private company. So you have to wake up in the morning, you have to go to work. Maybe it's gardening the mayor's uh, garden, or cleaning the streets, or changing light bulbs, or harvesting apples, but you have to wake up and have to work. And this is, this is a great thing. Obviously, at the beginning, they said this is an artificial creation of jobs, because this is not really driven by the economy. The good news is, once you make people work, and once people realize that if I'm mentally and physically fit, I have to work, because this is the only way I get a salary, this is the only way my kid go to, can go to school, then uh, the private industry starts to take those individuals. So what used to be a quite significant chunk of people, several hundreds of thousands of people were on these public works, this actually went down to one third compared to what it was when this program started. So we are quite proud about that. Also, Hungary was brave enough to reduce taxes significantly. Now we have the lowest taxes of, of in Europe. The personal income tax is 15% flat, and the corporate tax, the only single digit number in Europe, it's 9%. This created obviously another influx of, of major investors coming to the country. The US and Hungary is having a fantastic uh, trade relation. The uh, US is our number two investor in the country, which is a big deal uh, looking at the, at the geographical distance between us. We have more than uh, 1,700 US companies uh, working in Hungary. They employ more than 100,000 people. And their investment to reinvest, or their decision or interest to reinvest in the country is, uh, is very high, 60 to 70%, which is also a big deal. It means that uh, these are not empty promises what we are getting, but, but really 
but rather is the road uh, we are meeting up to the expectations of companies. Uh, on top of this, uh, this low uh, tax rate and the very good investment environment, we also created a, a pro-family environment as well. Um, we are struggling, just like all other European nations, to reproduce. But we believe reproduction should not be uh, clearly uh, man mandated by migration, but an internal organic growth of the nation would be also a very important thing to achieve. That's why, even though we have very low tax rates, uh, you can actually have tax reductions based on the number of kids you have. So with every single kids, your, your tax rate is reduced. And on average, uh, if you make a, an average salary and you have three kids, you hardly pay any taxes, basically. You have such a tax refund. Also, we have a, we have a program uh, for young couples uh, who are married uh, and who want to have their first house or first apartment they can get up to $70,000 worth of, of uh, subsidy for their homes, and only half of it has to be repaid with a very preferential rate. This created an incredible improvement in the demographics of the country. Fertility rates grew 17% in the last eight years. It's very difficult to change demographics if you, if you think about it, so that's a big deal. The number of marriages, number of marriages went up by 20%. Number of divorces went down by 20%, and number of abortions went down by 25%. In such a short period of time, we believe this is a big deal, and we hope that, that we will be able to continue on that path. Hungary also has a very significant uh, interaction and alliance within NATO. We became NATO members in 1999, and we have boots on the field. Uh, we also believe that, uh, that our contribution is quite significant. Uh, we, are, we have troops in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Kosovo. We are actually one of the largest contributors of the Kosovo forces. Uh, we have been uh, frequently uh, air policing the Baltic airspace. And we also have heavy airlifting capacities uh, in, in, in territory of Hungary for, for NATO forces. We have a very strong uh, uh, plan to meet the 2% of GDP spending uh, guideline, 2% uh, uh, of our GDP that will be spent on, on defense. Uh, our plan is to reach this number by 2024 or even sooner. The Prime Minister, after the elections, made a very strong statement that we would like to have, a, have an army that can defend itself. This is very rare in Europe these days, so I believe this is a very strong statement. Hungary has always uh, been a very strong supporter of, of U.S. policy on Israel. Uh, we have actually vetoed quite a few uh, U.S. bashing initiatives in the EU and in the United Nations as well. Uh, we believe uh, this is a very strong uh, uh, fact that uh, many times we were the only uh, country standing out of the crowd of the European Union that really supported Israel and the United States uh, towards Israel. We are also the only country in Europe, maybe in the world, I don't know, that has a state secretariat designated to protect persecuted Christians in the Middle East and in Africa. So we have a state secretary who's responsible for nothing but defending Christians. If you think about it, out of five people who are persecuted for their religion, four are Christians. And in this world of political correctness, we just simply don't name things on their name. So we believe we have to talk about Christians, and we have to be concerned about what ISIS did in the Middle East. We also have to be very concerned about the fact that 100 years ago, in the 1920s, approximately 35-40% of the population in the Middle East was, were Christians. Now it's 4-6%. to 6%. 4 to 6%. And this is around the birthplace of, of Jesus Christ. Those people are endangering or risking their lives for the, their religions. We don't know how easy it is for us uh, here. So, so we believe those, those people need help. And that's why we are very vocal about this. And we also put, again, boots on the ground. We have uh, created a, a program called Hungry Helps. And uh, I have actually heard complaining US aid uh, uh, 
uh, officials uh, about the fact that the U.S. has spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in Iraq and in neighboring countries in the past few years, but you don't really see a major impact of those. But if you go to Iraq, you see hungry helps here, hungry helps there. It's all there. And it's not about branding, it's not about marketing, it's actual help. There's a small town north of Mosul in Iraq. Uh, Hungary has rebuilt 981 houses in that small town, and 90% of the original population was able to return to their homes. We rebuilt 30 churches in Lebanon the last three years. We have had, uh, we have had aid programs uh, to improve infra infrastructure, schools, hospitals, and churches again in, in Jordan, in Lebanon, and in many other neighboring countries. And we have future commitments also to start rebuilding hospitals in, in uh, Syria as soon as the environment will, will make it possible. Uh, approximately one month ago, we signed an MOU with USAID uh, because we believe uh, we have a lot in common in terms of our desire to help those in need. And instead of just symptomatic relief, we should really have the root cause also of migration. Uh, and one of the most endangered uh, population is actually the Christians uh, of all uh, sub-regions of the Christian groups. And we believe if we have that, we have the whole population in, in these war-torn regions of the world. Okay, uh, maybe a few words about Brexit, uh, because I'm pretty sure this will come up uh, in the questions later on. Um, it hurts us. Uh, uh, I think from an ideological perspective, uh, the UK has been a great ally uh, for Hungary and for the B4 countries, uh, for that matter. In many European and worldwide uh, political debates, we were usually on the same side. Uh, we don't necessarily have the same problem as Poland with the, with the workforce, for example. There's one, more than one million people from Poland who work in the UK. Our number is it's like one-tenth uh, of that number, but uh, the UK is still one of our biggest investors. We hope that there will be an agreement between the European Union and, and, uh, and the UK uh, that will make it possible that the UK will continue to invest uh, in, the, in, in Europe. Also, uh, even if it's not going to be a completely free movement of people between the two countries, uh, hopefully, with mutually beneficial arrangements, uh, this can continue on, on, on some level. Um, there are estimations that the Hung Hungary's GDP will suffer approximately 0.5% of the GDP with, with, with a hard Brexit, but these are speculations. Obviously, this is not uh, exact science when we have those speculations. Uh, we certainly hope uh, that there will be a smooth landing of this. And uh, in our view, the European Union, rather than penalizing a country who wants to leave the European Union, should really look into itself and uh, see how you can make Europe more attractive for the members to stay in Europe and how to attract more countries, how to speed up uh, the accession of the Western Balkan, of, of Ukraine, or other countries to join the European Union. So this uh, mutually beneficial relationship between East and West, uh, less developed and more developed countries, can continue for another few decades in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. here in the United States is usually fake news. Uh, I, I, obviously I shouldn't be uh, using this term and uh, I'm not uh, criticizing the free press in, in the United States, 
but I haven't read a proper objective uh, situation analysis of, of this case uh, since I've been here in the US. Quite simply, the uh, Hungarian uh, higher education uh, authority ran, ran an audit uh, in Hungary a few years ago, it was like three years ago, two and a half years ago, and they found 28 institutions of higher education to be non-compliant with the higher educational uh, legislation of Hungary. 27 of them decided to comply and they did their administrative changes and, and they are happy to continue their work. And one of them, guess which one, uh, actually went to the media and started crying about Hungary's uh, will to destroy freedom of academia in Hungary. This was the response. Now, what this one university does is a very simple thing. Uh, they have two legal entities. One of them is in Hungary, which is uh, translated to be Central European University. The Hungarian name is Középel Opelietem, K-A-D-E, Középel Opelietem, Central European University. That's the translation. So that's a Hungarian legal entity. And they have been running this university for 26 years with great success. And there's another one, uh, which is a New York uh, entity, New York, New York, in Manhattan, there's, a, there's an office of a foundation called Open Society, and they have a post box for a university there that is called Central European University. There's no professors, no teachers, no students there. But this university, this post box university, is issuing American diplomas in Hungary. So that was the problem, and that's still the problem. And uh, the Hungarian government provided three alternatives for this, uh, for this uh, institution. Uh, <coughs> they said you either have to have a mother institution in the United, uh, in the United States, or you have to move to Hungary, so that, or European Union, uh, and, and be legal, basically, be existent before you start issuing a diploma. They have not fulfilled that obligation. And what I read, even these days in the media, they say that, uh, that uh, CEU is moving to Vienna. It might be true, but I'm pretty sure the moving company is stretching their head for why to move, which is the table they have to put there. Uh, CEU is actually advertising on their homepage. Check out their homepage. They are recruiting for next year's, uh, next year's students there, because they will continue to exist in Hungary. They are not moving. They are opening a new faculty like something in Vienna. I'm still curious if the, if the higher education laws of Austria let a non-existent university to issue American diplomas in Austria, but that's another problem and this is not our problem anymore. So we did not force this university out. 27 out of 28 problematic institutions had found a solution quite easily and quickly. This one went for a PR war they're very powerful, of course, so there's no doubt they did a fantastic PR job. But it, this has nothing to do with academic freedom, and this has nothing to do with the freedom of, of higher education or any education. Ooh, lots of questions. I don't know. Please? Also, I want to ask you about migration. Uh -huh. uh, my name is Sai Shetar. I study Libya, actually. So. Uh, there's an understanding of sort of all the, the many factors in North Africa that are pushing many sub-Saharan African migrants north towards the EU. Yes. And in your water pipes example, you're saying, well, <coughs> the EU should be focusing on the root causes, not on what is happening when someone gets here. So I guess the question is quite simply, what would you or Hungary like to see the EU be doing more to address the root causes of migration before folks even get to the EU? Yes. Uh, let me go back three years. Uh, before Angela Merkel made an open invitation to Syrians, uh, approximately 4 to 6 percent of people claimed themselves Syrian at the southern border of Hungary. Next day, after the Angela Merkel announcement happened, 60 percent of them became Syrian. 60 percent of them. Obviously, I'm not saying everyone was lying, but, uh, but uh, we found tons of thrown away and torn up passports on our southern border. Uh, quite clearly, when it comes to goodwill and, uh, and kind of economic uh, desires, uh, these are two, two very different things. Quite clearly, if the European Union does not uh, apply its own rules, which is 
the Schengen Treaty and the Dublin regulations. The Schengen Treaty mandates every single country that has an external border of the European Union to provide control. So you have to manage the influx of, of migrants. Uh, there's legal ways and processes to, to do that. Uh, otherwise, you are failing uh, to meet uh, this commitment to the European Union. So this is one thing. If Europe would be applying those rules, there will be simply no place for for economic migrants to come. So they would stop. That's very simple. If you cannot go somewhere, you don't. Uh, the other thing is, which is even more important, is really to treat the root cause, because there's an incredible number of, of people in, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, that are really living their day-to-day -day, uh, life uh, under the, the bare minimum. I believe uh, the World Bank defines that two dollars income per day per person. A significant, a few billion people actually live in that poverty. This is where the developed world should help. This is where it's our responsibility, our common responsibility and human responsibility to provide meaningful future for these people. We have to create problem, programs where those countries who are in, in deep poverty can, can create working uh, conditions, building houses, building schools, <coughs> building hospitals, and start thriving. Uh, if, if we use our development programs in a way that are effective and they really make a difference in lives, and I'm very glad to see in the last three years Hungary have been able to do this even we are a small country and we spent approximately 25 million uh, million dollars in, in, in the Near East but you can see the results so we are being praised by so many who have been in Iraq in Lebanon how effective that initiative was I believe if, if big countries would uh, approach this problem complex problem in a similar way we could really make a difference in the lives of those people Nobody wants to leave their motherland. Nobody. But when you are forced to, because of economic reasons, or sometimes fake promises, then this is what happens. Unfortunately, or for, I, I don't know, I, I shouldn't really quantify or qualify for this statement, uh, it's a fact that it's not the poorest who leave any country. It's actually the, the, the modestly better off people who have the desire, the will, or even the financial tools to move. Most of those economic migrants who reach Europe, they actually sold their house, their cows, their property, and they gave that money to human traffickers. And this is how they ended up there. It's not a free ride to cross the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so let's not fool ourselves. It's not the poorest people who start going to Europe or to the United States for that matter. Thank you. Please. My name is Dr. Hartman. I'm a Fulbright uh, scholar currently uh, at the English language at the school. Uh, obviously, I'm going to bring you back to Brexit. Uh, love my bread. Um, Britain's been uh, an independent child of Europe for centuries. Um, saved Europe from itself many times. And it has done uh, courageously. Uh, we entered uh, the European Union quite hesitantly. And we're leaving that way as well. I think it's primarily because uh, the false promises uh, that Europe gave. And personally, I was pro uh, pro Europe and a Remainer, and that kind of changed my mind after the behavior of the European Union and the over overwhelming dominant bureaucracy there that's really screwing us up. And, uh, and uh, the, the false propaganda that we're going to suffer so much because Britain's only been a forefront of world politics, and that we will survive this. It'll take a few years, and we'll make make better of our situation. And I think uh, my question here is that, given that that probably is the case, we well, don't know, obviously, but uh, we are going to suffer in the, in the short term. What would be the prospects of other countries who see some light at the end of the tunnel, uh, getting away from the bureaucracy and probably large bureaucracy in uh, Brussels, Hungary, for example? Well, thank you very much. Uh, for the sake of the complete answer, I will repeat a few thoughts and I will add a few new ones uh, to my answer. First of all, we believe that a strong Europe can be made of strong member states. So those member states who are economically thriving, who are growing, who, are, uh, who have a strong identity, they will make Europe stronger. It's not a strong waterhead in Brussels that will provide that. 
We are also frustrated about the last few years of, the, of European leadership. Of course, uh, we are sorry for the UK to leave, but we have no doubt that the UK will thrive on the long run and they will, uh, we will remain committed friends and supporters of, of, of the United Kingdom. Um, but uh, I see as the light at the end of the tunnel is the European parliamentary elections. So basically, if, uh, if you look at the trend of what happened mm -hmm. during the uh, national elections in the last two years, it's quite clear that the current leadership of the European Union is not fit uh, to the job of what they are doing. They were not elected by the people of Europe, uh, but this European Parliament elections will give, uh, hopefully, power for, uh, I'm a little bit scared uh, to use the word nationalistic or populistic because this has a very bad connotation in American press these days, but I would say more patriotic uh, voices in Europe. Hopefully this has a positive, more positive connotation in, in, in your mind. So, so uh, we respect the decision of the, of, the, of the British people. So, of course, if they decided to leave and they leave, that's it. So we have to deal with the consequences. But we don't think that they should be penalized for this. So I think we should really look for a meaningful, reasonable trade agreement between the UK and, and Europe. We, as Hungarians, or Poland, or Czech, or Austria, we cannot negotiate with the, with the UK for trade agreements, it has to be the European Union that negotiates. We hope that common sense will prevail in those negotiations. Sir? Uh, thank you. How was that uh, the Public Works Program first received when it was introduced by the Hungarian people who were on welfare programs? Well, obviously it was a very complex, uh, complex set of, of new rules and guidelines, uh, but money talks. So quite clearly, if you lose your subsidy, your unemployment aid, after three months, you have to show up somewhere because you have to eat. So, so I think this helps. Of course, this, uh, this is dependent on your fitness to work physically and mentally. So, so nobody is forcing anyone to do, to do something that they are not fit uh, to do. Uh, and since uh, uh, education in Hungary is free, unless you choose otherwise, uh, up to your first diploma, you don't have to pay uh, a cent or Hungarian for it for your education. Of course, it always costs money to have shoes and books uh, for your kids. But by the way, books are provided for Hungarian kids free of charge by the government. Uh, so, up to your first uh, diploma, uh, education is free of charge. Uh, we have full healthcare coverage uh, for all our employees. This costs money. For this, we need workers who pay taxes, even if those taxes are the lowest in Europe. They have to work, they have to contribute. And uh, so basically, we wanted to move from the subsidy-based mindset to a labor-centered mindset. And its numbers tell us that this was successful. Uh, in the less developed uh, parts of the country, we still have areas where the unemployment is a little bit higher. Uh, but uh, the European Union cohesion funds, for example, are helping there because we can get a higher subsidy rate for those companies who who invest in the less developed parts of the country, uh, so we can provide more job opportunities for those people. Uh, and the biggest challenge for us is really not to find jobs anymore, because, because we have incredible influx of, of investment. It's how to provide more value, how to digitalize the country, how to become uh, 21st century in all parts of the country. Luckily, we are in the forefront of many, many things, like, like autonomous car development. Uh, we are building the most modern uh, and probably the largest test track for autonomous cars in Hungary. Uh, it's, it's going to be a great success when it opens. The capacities have been booked forever. Um, laser technology, digitalization of healthcare, uh, global shared service centers. We are actually in the forefront of, of growth in all those areas in the European Union. So, so this digitalization idea and modernization, the higher added value, is the name of the game now. Instead of made in Hungary, we would like to say invented in Hungary or innovated in Hungary. That's, that's the name of the game. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the opinion, mm -hmm. your opinion on the effectiveness of physical barriers in terms of uh, protecting the border. And at what point do you think a, a migrant crisis becomes an emergency? Is it in terms of the number of people or something like a humanitarian crisis? <coughs> Migration has been happening in Hungary and in many in all European uh, countries for ever, for, for decades, and this was kind of a natural 
in the in Middle Ages also, migration was a kind of natural thing. Uh, but we could see an exponential growth of that that led up to the 2015 crisis. Until uh, people came in the dozens, obviously we had enough force uh, to, to apply. And uh, when we are talking about maybe a dozen people here, a dozen people there, it doesn't create an economic crisis uh, or even a political crisis in the country. But when we are talking about thousands of individuals marching through in a small country like Hungary, where within three hours you leave the country, whichever way you go from Budapest on the highway, uh, that's a major deal, eight to 10,000 people a day. In the first uh, two thirds of, of 2015, we had 800,000, no, 400,000 people who marched through without any control. Uh, and, uh, and when you have people from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from other countries, uh, not like there's anything wrong with those countries, but they are they can be a security threat when you don't know where, who they are, they don't know why they are coming. And if you look at the terrorist attacks that happened in the last three years in, in Europe, we are talking about uh, uh, an incredible number of, of terrorist attacks we, it's never seen before. And many of them were committed, if not most, uh, were committed by illegal migrants who came in. The Bataclan bloodshed, uh, where they killed 130 people in Paris, uh, those were identified as illegal migrants who came through the Hungarian border. Uh, actually, luckily we had, uh, uh, we had uh, fingerprints of those individuals, uh, so it, it was proven that they actually came through with the crowd. Uh, so not everyone has good intentions. We are not saying that all, all migrants are, are terrorists, not at all. But for ISIS that was a very easy path to Europe. If, if you don't, know, of course, if you just take a boat 400 people on them, if it is just one who will start shooting in Brussels on the uh, you have a problem. And uh, I'm not saying that uh, it's a bulletproof solution, uh, but, uh, but the physical barrier is actually to regulate the influx of people. So it's not to stop, as I mentioned to you before, the official border crossing the areas are there. So anyone who wants to cross legally, uh, we are open for business. Uh, but illegal migration can be only controlled if you have a physical barrier, in our view. And uh, if we are mandated by the European Union, we have to protect the border, so there's no choice. If, if the numbers are so high, you have, to, you have to do something. And that's what we did. We are channeling the people towards the official border crossing areas. That's, that's why you need a fence, a wall, you can call it whatever. If you, have, if you are lucky and you have a canyon or a sea between you, it, it makes it more easy to defend. Of course, forests and fields, uh, those are more difficult to, to, to protect. Please. I have a question. Yeah. We should finish soon? Yeah, thank you. Hello, I would have many questions, but I'm trying to, I'm going to try to keep it. Can you speak up? Uh, yeah, I, I would have many questions, but I'm going to try to keep it. Uh, yeah. You said at the end of your speech that the EU should try uh, not to punish the countries that have decided to leave, but to attract those were already in. So what specific policy should the EU as an institution do in order to attract the EU or how you want to Well, one idea for politicians is to, to listen and hear what the people have to say in your country or in the group of countries. Uh, Hungary uh, initiated a so-called national consultation in 2011, I believe, and in the last eight years, eight of those consultations took place, and we simply asked people, what do you think of migration? What do you think of, of the work uh, system what we came up with? What do you think of families? And basically, a long list of questions. And uh, out of the, out of the uh, 10 million strong uh, uh, population, approximately, I don't know, half of them can vote. 3 million responded, responses came on average to every single of those, of those questionnaires. 3 million people took the time to sit down in their families, to discuss the answer, and send it back. So we are pretty up to date on what the people want and what the people think in Hungary. Uh, the European Union has not done that. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that Emmanuel Macron just announced like three weeks ago that they would like to do an, uh, a national consultation. It's, uh, it's interesting. But that, but you, asked, you asked the people in, in Hungary, right? Like all around Europe, I guess people have different opinions. What do you think 
the European Union should do to address all of your skeptics around Europe, not just the Hungarian? Well, the good news is that the European Union is, is not a totalitarian system. It's an economic alliance, okay? So the European Union doesn't have to take care of many things. The European Union doesn't have to take care of our religion, or our taxes, or our higher education system. The European Union has its own law. The problem comes when they want to decide for everything for us, uh, jeopardizing the sovereignty of the countries. Maybe one last question. Did you summarize or give a profile <coughs> about the Hungarian people and or their politicians view the immigration crisis in this country and or how the Trump administration is handling it, good, bad, sympathetic, or hostile? How do they view us? Uh, first of all, it's not my role to praise or criticize the United States for everything that they do. That's an internal affair. Internal affair. Uh, and we don't expect other countries to criticize us or praise us. Uh, we believe it's a sovereign decision of any country. Uh, but obviously, if, if you look at the profile of the Trump administration, and for that matter, the Obama administration as well, uh, I heard uh, Obama and many others uh, to say that we have to stop illegal migration, we have to control our borders. So we are on the same page. We are on the same page. This was the last question, but the last but one. Okay. <laughs> the last one. The, um, it's clear that the political situation in Europe is changing. Yes. And uh, uh, the establishment parties are being pushed out. You know, Macron's popularity is down to 18 or 20 percent. You know, when he started off, uh, Merkel is on the way, clearly on the way out. Uh, she's barely hanging out. Uh, the League and the Five Star Movement in Italy are clearly anti-immigrant. Uh, the Brexit. Uh, Probably the main reason for the, for the cost for the Brexit, and Niall Ferguson argues this beautifully, it's not the economics uh, benefits that the Brits want. They are afraid that if they stay in a union, that the refugees from Germany and other places will be uh, will uh, will come in bigger numbers. So my question would, for to you is: with these trends, clear trends going on. How long will the European Union be able to stay together as an entity? Uh, I will be relatively quick with this answer, uh, and this was your last, uh, the last question. Uh, we believe in the European Union principle. And we believe the good intentions of the, of the founding fathers of the European Union, and we believe the European Union has a place, and it has to grow and has to thrive in the future. Uh, the one thing uh, that's that's important, and, uh, and this is where where the Brexit is, is an, an unfortunate event, uh, the, the, there will be a new balance in the European Union, uh, and we are quite hopeful that the Visegrad four countries and the, uh, the similar countries who who look at the real problems of people and the real challenges of of, of migration, real challenges of economy, uh, will hopefully unite and will be stronger. If you take the Visegrad four countries, Czech, Slovak, Poland, and Hungary, uh, that's the 15th largest economy in the world. The trade between Germany and the Visegrad four countries is 55 times, 55% higher than the trade between France and Germany. And since we are quite alike in terms of our history, our traditions, our culture, and the dynamics how these four countries developed, we basically outgrew the average of the European Union twofold. We outgrew the average of the Eurozone threefold in the last five years. We believe uh, the new balance will give opportunities to other countries as well. And we hope that the new election in May will also provide benef benefits for the people of the European Union so that their voice is heard and politicians will listen more. They will be more careful about their leadership. So, so I'm actually optimistic about the future of the European Union. I might be wrong, I don't know. But uh, it's quite clear that there will be major changes and new dynamics in the European Union. We are hoping for the better. Thank you very much. For